before we jump into these panels where you know people have more prepared input so we have a little bit more open and horizontal discussion that's pretty free form where people can uh, propose topics and questions and themes that you would like to see discussed and explored um, is really just a place to kind of you know set some of the, the, the guiding themes and frameworks we want to work with. Uh, the, the broad theme is, is it social ecology and the state of our movements today. So it's incredibly broad. We can talk about social ecology, we can talk about movements, we can talk about the interface of those two things. Um, as I mentioned before, for the people that are arrived a little bit late, um, this year's theme, we always have kind of a, a loose general theme that has lots of sub-themes that don't always entirely line up perfectly. But the, the general theme is beyond the local, uh, which is very much inspired by uh, the symbiosis project that we'll be meeting here very soon in the future of the Congress of Municipal Movements. So it seems like a good opportunity to kind of take stock of where we're at, um, especially for those of us, many of us that were here last year, the years before, you know, the, the state of play, what's changed, what hasn't changed, where are we um, today? So with that, I think the floor is quite open. Anyone want to start us off with a thought? Thesis, observation. Can I, can I just ask someone who um, is on the panel or represents kind of, or is more close up with what's going on with ISC, uh, just to explain exactly what you're talking about, where the movement is at and where various things are going and happening? That is the open question. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone will give you a different answer. <laughs> well, you know, I'm feeling very optimistic for a change. <laughs> and it's a relatively new phenomenon for me because when I look around the room, I see that there are as many people under 30 here as there are over 50. Yes. <laughs> Very encouraging because it means to me that a new generation has embraced these ideas and is actively working with them and advancing them and taking them forward in a way that uh, makes me feel positive and feel like we're beginning to build something that has some momentum and the potential to really interact with the situation that exists today and, and offer some ideas that people are willing to listen to willing to embrace, and I'm hoping that we're really on the cusp of something, that, that moment of birth after nine months of gestation. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting the insurrection that will break out tomorrow, but I feel like we're, we're approaching things realistically and incrementally, and moving ahead systematically, and uh, for me, that's what it's all about. So I'll put that out. Can you, can you elaborate on the systematically? Yeah, I'm, I'm referring specifically to the work that Symbiosis is doing, that you all are doing, and organizing the Congress of Municipal Movements, that there's been a very directed building process that's tried to check all the boxes in terms of inclusivity and real democratic process, quite self-conscious about what it's about, and is learning from the lessons of history and the lessons of the past. And I see all of that as a pretty systematic approach, certainly compared to what I've seen in the development of most other, other organizations. Um, so that's what I mean. Sorry. that 
I'm just so aware during the last two and a half years or so that the historical logic of the moment that we're in has changed so dramatically from when I first encountered Murray's ideas. I was 21 in 1984 when I stumbled upon the ISC and became decided to study with Murray intensively for many years. And Murray, you know, was a utopian thinker, obviously. And, um, that moment was so different. We were coming off, you know, it's the 80s, which was still, it was, you know, we were in the middle still of the, the new social movements, still had momentum in the 80s. We were in, I was in the anti-nuclear movement, and the Greens were trying to figure out who we were, Green Greens and the Left Greens, and, since Trump came to power, I feel so entirely different about the revolutionary project and of that in the US. I'm speaking right now, but I'm, I'm also very aware that this is a problem. I'm going to slide to the populist white nationalist right. This goes far beyond the US. Um, I'm just very aware that the the historical sort of logic or illogic, the irrationality of the current political landscape is so um, blaring to, I'm not, not thinking it's just me who's, who's noticed, <laughs> um, that for me it completely changes how I relate to the utopian sort of project and to how I understand what we should be, we, the collective we, if we are at the left, in some way, what we should be doing feels really, really, really different. And it makes me so sad to say that out loud and to feel that just so deeply. And just that's just there for me. And I'm obviously not the only one. It doesn't feel like like organizing as usual. There's something crawling on me. <laughs> follow up to that a little bit. Could you speak a little bit? Sure, I can talk really loud. <laughs> um, so Hi and I were having this conversation, and um, we were looking at some of the newer movements. You know, we were talking about this is a moment where we really need to be fighting fascism, and what does that look like, and how could so social ecology contribute to that work? And, you know, I both am, I'm just astounded in teaching um, on the online course with Phil, that there actually are directly democratic assemblies. I mean, I know about Cooperation Jackson, but it's just so exciting for me to hear the examples that are happening around the country that many of you all are involved in, let alone around the world, um, that we couldn't point to 15 years ago at the Institute for Social Ecology. We'd be like, the Zapatistas, or like, you know, like the Iroquois. You know, I mean, we, we didn't have present day assemblies in the United States that we could point to. And that's super exciting. And I do see it as a little bit of a split in the movement between people who are focusing on direct democracy and um, a utopistic utop utop project and those who are doing resistance work. Obviously there's a lot of um, the folks that are doing the assemblies are doing a lot of that work as well. But in terms of like, there's a lot of national direct action movements that are youth involved that are not, that have no reconstructive program. And I've been arguing with them for years because some of them, and they're amazing, I feel like they have the, the, um, the, the transitional program that the ISC was always struggling to find, like something that, act, that actually can go to scale in, a, in three to five years and have a real direct impact. Um, and I'm talking about Cosecha, and if not now, and some of the movements that come out of the momentum style um, training, which I can talk to you more about. I'm not gonna talk about it now, it's with the for Social Ecology. But um, what I think that social ecology could lend to some of these movements that aren't necessarily going to have a revolutionary vision, and they're specifically choosing not to so that they can be a, they can be popular movements, which I think is really smart in these moments as well. Like I feel like there's room for both of these tendencies. 
But in looking at some of the rhetoric, particularly against this fascist moment, there's um, a newer movement called, um, that's a Jewish-led movement looking at some of the immigration horrors that we're looking at um, called Never Again. What is it called? Never Again. Never again. Okay. And it's interesting because they don't have an analysis, they, they don't bring democracy into their rhetoric, which is very brief, and I don't think it needs to be lengthy, but I think one of the things the Institute for Social Ecology does so well, I don't think we need to invite them into our revolutionary program. I don't think that they're necessarily going to see that as strategic for their movements, but having some rhetoric that is looking at what democracy means, even though we live in a republic, a republican democracy, like really, at least educating folks about the difference between republicanism, republicanism and democracy. There's, so there's a power analysis around what is being eroded that's not simply about putting people into to cages or children into cages, but is, a, is looking at and being able to read the systematic erosion of what, what vestigial forms of democracy that we have. I think that would be a really interesting interface for social ecology to have. Can I ask a sort of follow-up question in terms of like extending your analysis? Like you were identifying what you call two, you know, sectors or wings or manifestations or directions of what you consider to be a, the movement or a movement. But where do you put or how do you analyze something like DSA? That where would you put DSA in this? To be honest, I, do. I wouldn't answer that. I feel like Blair could answer that. I I was asking you as you. No, I, I mean, I, will, I, I can answer the movements that I have direct experience with, but I don't have enough experience with DSA to answer that. But well, I think it's, a different anal it's a different analysis. I mean, that's part of the room. How many DSA members do we have here right now? That's a good question. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more last year. It was way more last year. <laughs> But are there any members? Are there any people who were members of DSA who are not now? Oh yes. <laughs> I got kicked out in the nineties. Good. Right time to get kicked out. Another cover. The DSA. They abolished the abolition. I mean, as. There was this conversation that was kind of like mapping a little bit of like the current contemporary left landscape, and you know we mentioned symbiosis as like pulling together a lot of like left libertarian groups from Cooperation Jackson to Olympia Assembly, a variety of groups that are really consciously working with kind of like very social ecological themes and concepts, and you know popular assemblies, dual power, etc. And then Brooke mentioned a variety of other kind of like much more amorphous often civil disobedience and direct action movements and thinking like Extinction Rebellion, things like this. A lot of the, the environmental movement uh, these days, I would say, kind of falls into that. But yeah, I was thinking, like, I'm glad you asked that. I was thinking, well, where does DSA fit into that as probably the largest, like, you know, single organization of the left at the moment with almost 60,000 members with chapters in every um, state. And uh, I mean, I'm involved with that. I helped set up a chapter when I moved back to my hometown for largely opportunistic reasons. It was like a left-wing, you know, working-class socialist organization talking about eco-socialism, talking about other things that I felt were important that resonated with people, and people were seeking it out. So it was really just kind of like, if you build it, they will come type of thing. And it's a big tent organization, so you have anarchists, you have like the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, which a lot of symbiosis people are a part of, and then you have like Marxist-Leninists, you have Maoists, you have liberals, you have the whole gamut. So, and it's really, uh, very big differences between the big chapters and the small chapters and even within those chapters, so it's really um, a wide open question. But I think, I mean, an, a question I'm interested in pursuing this weekend is how this, you know, political formation, which takes up a lot of space and has a lot of visibility, interacts with symbiosis and like, you know, the movements that a lot of us are kind of coming more out of, I guess. How do those things interface? And I understand that, you know, there's a large, you know, libertarian socialist caucus within symbiosis is, um, has feet in both worlds, but uh, what are the core, I guess, differences uh, of strategy and, and, and political theory? Uh, where are the areas to work together? 
how do we how do we think this together as like a, a left ecosystem? Because one thing I think that's also changed is like going back to like our vintage of the alter globalization movements um, was like that kind of sectarianism of like anarchist versus Marxist duh, 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 is totally gone. I mean, when I was coming of political age, Marxists were just irrelevant, you know, sectarian paper hawkers that were just like laughable. <laughs> I mean, really which is quite <laughs> funny because one of those people in my hometown was Kashama Savant, who is now obviously not an irrelevant paper hawker, but back then they were, they were the kind of more sane ones. But, um, but that seems to have disappeared. There seems to be a lot more kind of like those ideological divisions, at least in my uh, experience, have like broken down. You have people working together, I mean, in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, especially around concrete actions, anti-fascist organizing, anti-ICE organizing, you have IWW, you have ESA, you have Olympia Assembly, um, who else? Random anarchist groups. But you have like a, a broad spectrum of people from across different left tendencies working together, which to me is fairly new. But all like they're, they're united, you know, around an anti capitalist perspective. Most of them are like anti state, even if various tendencies will engage with the state strategically, um, realizing it's not going anywhere tomorrow. Someone's going to fill that space. So I don't know. Some of the, those are some of the strategic questions, I guess, um, and political questions that I'm interested in exploring this weekend? I think beyond just like tactical alignment of groups that were at each other's throats 20 years ago, I think there's also been a pretty stunning and rapid um, ideological cross-pollination convergence on a number of different fronts. And one of the things I find really exciting about it is that most of those points of emerging crossover um, are things that in one way or another started in social ecology and like many of the people who have like taken them, taken them up in a different form don't know that. Um, I mean I'm thinking things like um, the shift from the workplace to the places where people live as like the primary site of working class organizing. That's something that like, I've, you know, loads of Marxists have embraced in the tenant organizing world. Um, thinking of the pretty rapid um, popularization of eco-socialism as a broader framework for climate justice and you know, the need to overcome capitalism to have any chance of sustainability. Um, in a somewhat smaller sphere of, um, of emerging cross-pollination, I think the broader dual power framework as a um, revolutionary program is one that um, groups that would have been at each other's throats 20 years ago is now that's like their basis for, um, for unity politically. Um, and that's not just symbiosis, that's things like the Marxist Center or um, all kinds of different projects or you know, subgroups within, within DSA. Uh, I think I can answer some of the questions about DSA and symbiosis' relationship if I can do that presently. Um, the, I mean, functionally what it's been for us is just a very convenient um, way to reach people in a way that we could not possibly do if DSA did not exist. I mean, it's just pretty remarkable what um, things can bubble up when most of the left is under one roof. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wouldn't say that, I, I don't think it makes sense to say like what's the difference in the DSA program versus what, what we're doing because DSA doesn't have a program. DSA is just where socialists come together and do stuff and you know they have particular things that, that come out of that. Um, or it's like you know, more specific um, political approach. Um, but like th that's something that's that's happened in lots of different cities, even just on a local level. Like the fact of everyone being in the same room at some point um, opens up possibilities for movement building that you know, otherwise we really have to like struggle to pull together. I'm wondering about the, the, uh, the level of participation and leadership by people of color in 
frontline communities in any of these movements? Uh, and I, that's a, a question that I really think is an important one that we are still struggling with, very much so, obviously, in this context. And, um, you know, I think in the, in the alternative agriculture and food movement, I think I have been very encouraged by the rising leadership of more, you know, African American and Latino and, um, and migrants of one kind or another. And, and uh, that, that movement is really beginning to become not so much in some parts of it, but in food justice and uh, movements like that, food sovereignty, uh, land use, there's been a quite noticeable and encouraging rise of, of people of color. So I'm wondering if that's also the case in, in with some of the movements y'all have been talking about. I think a lot of the youth movements that I witness, they are, there's a, a very great degree of awareness and of, of, uh, of leadership of, of those most affected, certainly in the immigrant rights movement. Um, COSECA is all led by um, most impacted folks. It, they tend to be very young. I mean, under 30 almost across the board. And so I think it lack, oftentimes there's a lack of age diversity, some of that I think is intentional and doesn't often feel good um, to people who are older. Um, but I think trust that, anyone over 30. Yeah, I mean, it's funny when, when you get way over 30. <laughs> you get asked to be an advisor. And they all go to, I'm 47, nobody wants me in the movement. Um, but uh, I think that, that that is very much alive. Even in the Jewish-led organizations, there's a, a strong focus on non-Ashkenazi Jewish leadership. I think some might um, share Dan's optimism because, like you see, you know, the multi-generational, just in this room, I spent 30 years as an academic advisor at San Francisco State, and my whole world was you. And right now, what I see going on, like, look at the anti-gun movement, those kids out of Parkland and stuff, you got to groom the youngsters. Because think about the civil rights movement was based on high college kids sitting at lunch counters. You know, and um, in fact, I remember Jesse Jackson speaking in Sacramento one time, and he said it was the college students that snatched down the cotton curtain of apartheid in the South. And I'm seeing that now. And, and the only dimension is, you know, I haven't cut my teeth in the civil rights movement, the only dimension, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, but at this point, it's so Orwellian. Mm -hmm. That's what scares me, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, there's some surreal stuff going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I try to watch a little bit of news in the morning and, and try to turn it off before I get too mad. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some insanity here. We got a fascist, we got a Nazi in the White House. That's right. Right. That's right. You know, I mean, that's cut and dry, and that Miller, yeah. he's like, Gurring or something, you know, the dude, I've never seen somebody yeah. so anti everybody and so fascist, yeah. yet people are giving him some kind of legitimacy, you know. It's like I said, it's been on the news the other day, and those kids are thinking, you know, they're you know, they're really thinking out the box. It's not like you know, they're just mad about what happened because they experienced some crazy stuff. And even my, like my grandson asked me the other day, do they really sell bulletproof backpacks? And I had to tell him, yeah. That's the world we're living in, and that scares me to death, because I got grandbabies, I got nieces and nephews all going to school. It's like a whole nother dimension that maybe we didn't have before. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I mean, I don't think my optimism negates the fact that I'm scared shitless. And I, 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 I mean, you know, we really are at a point where it's, you can conceivably think of a true fascist state emerging, full-blown, full you know, and it could happen as soon as 2020. Mm -hmm. So, 
certainly there is that ever-present existential despair. But at the same time, for me, the, the, you know, I've said it before, if I wasn't optimistic about ultimately the arc of history, I would have put a gun to my head a long time ago. So. That, that's what's so confusing to me, is that I feel like yeah, I was born in 1962, not knowing I was born in 1962, you know? And um, then I, I came of age during the counterculture, you know? Like, that was reality. And even though I could see how horrifying things were, that racism and sexism and all forms of xenophobia, you know, Oppression of sexual minorities. You know, even though I could see all of that, I felt like there was this overall arc. There was this sort of directionality incrementally towards things getting a little bit better on some levels. And again, it gave me sort of like a, a, like a place to pitch the tent of the utopian sort of movement that I wanted to be part of trying to work on. And I think about the young people, and I feel like they're sort of sacked with the inheritance of all the failures of the new social movements that were, a lot of them were around inclusivity and diverse representativity, et cetera. They're sacked with that. And they're also sacked with you know, an, an arc of history that to me is not going like this right now. I mean, to me, I look at young people and I'm like, holy mother of God. I cannot imagine I cannot imagine going to the streets now wondering, you know, when will protests become entirely criminalized? And, and I was saying to Rick and McCart today that, you know, when an AOC said that kids in cages were like concentration camps, I felt that that was the proper use of the term and that it was apt and important to say that, that we're not, we're not like almost there. Like this shit is happening. And, if people think Trump is too stupid to keep pushing the envelope to see if there's a response from the left, he's doing that shit, whether under the advice of Vlad or not, he's doing that shit. And the, and the question is, do these young people know what to do? And, and the, older, the elders here need to have some leadership to say, here's how we organize. And, I'll, I'll, I know I've said too much, but I, I, I keep waiting to see why is there not a national strike? Why, since the election of this explicit fascist who has children in, with no diapers in cages, why is there not just a national general strike? Why has that not happened yet? And what will it take for us to get there? And there has to be broad-based coalitions. I mean, this is where I'm like, fuck being... I don't care if I'm an anarchist, I'm a democratic socialist, fuck it. We're, at this point, we have to be trying to, to, to resurrect or protect the vestiges of a democracy before it goes over and lock, becomes locked into a fascistic, um, oligarchic you know, mess. Like, I don't want to slow cook our way to living in Russia. And I feel like we're not far. I'm sitting behind this chair because we tried to bring the next generation in. And <laughs> so I get for a minute and then popped out. But um, I want to, yeah, sure. I want to directly respond to that piece about what the youth are feeling. And I think you have like a bit of a young corner over here, and maybe a tiny bit out of the circle. Um, but I think, or I see that there's a deep nihilism within our generation and the generation below us that is pervasive throughout all facets of our life, right? And like you all, if you get on the internet, you'll see the memes that just, you know, expl explain in all different kinds of ways that we understand that there's not a future. Like, that is real in our minds. Um, and there's optimism. So it's both. And this question of why is there not a national strike, like to make that optimism possible and to make that future possible, like it is such a huge hurdle. And we don't have the strength of the movement yet to be able to do that. And the leaders who are 
the smartest folks between age 25 and 45 right now are stuck in nonprofit jobs. Where their strategy, our strategy, I work for a nonprofit, right? <laughs> our strategy in some ways, and I don't I don't want to speak for my organization, but many of the organizations, right, the strategy is constrained by funding. Yeah. And so we need all of you all, elders who are not constrained by the funding, who have the deep history, to help lead that strategy because it's not gonna come out of the nonprofit industrial complex. It's just straight up not. And the young people are ready for that leadership, are ready to do what it takes because we know that to get over the, the deep nihilism, to get to that place of optimism, it's gonna take a heck of a lot and people are ready to put, put out whatever we've got to get there because our lives depend on it. But the strategy to do that needs to come from the elder generation who's you know, retired, who has financial means to be able to spend time on it, who, has, who have the skills to organize, and who have the relationships from movements past mm -hmm. to be able to cross-racially organized, cross-class organized, cross-all-borders organized. So I want to bring that into the room and, and ask for that help humbly. I think um, the sort of systemic and structural vision I have um, for that support to be delivered to, to young people, be us Gen Z, be us millennials, um, looks like a really powerful confederated network of um, movement training operations. I, um, I heard, uh, not quite the members' names yet, but somebody over there was mentioning Momentum, um, and I'm sure some of us are familiar with Momentum training, um, I spent the past eight months writing a thesis just looking at a bunch of different social movement training groups, um, including Malcolm X Grassroots, which Cooperation Jackson comes out of. And what I came back with after interviewing a bunch of people who have been leading, training-focused um, left organizations for, for years is that we need to invest in schools. We need to invest in movement training organizations. And that, I think, is, is one of the necessary vehicles at a broad, um, confederated international level to bridge a generational gap that we're talking about here. And um, to <laughs> for us to learn from the, uh, the deep, practical movement experience all of y'all are carrying. So um, I think that there needs to be a systemic way to deliver that accumulated movement experience that y'all movement elders have, and, and I want it to look like um, a training confederation. To add to that, I mean, schools are key, right? But that's not everything. Like, we don't necessarily need to go to school to help enact a national strike. You know, that, that's a piece of it. And the leadership cannot only be to teach. It also has to be to provide strategy for the actions that need to happen and get people out of doors and into the streets to do what needs to happen. Um, and that leadership also needs to come. So it's both. I wanted to say something about that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in Albany, I teach college students, and a lot of them always say the biggest thing about not mobilizing is their fear of not being able to pay back their student loans. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and that's like the crushing yeah. burden. Yeah. And the idea that they can't, that they're, they're basically are 18, 19, 20 years old, and they see no future in terms of shaping their own future because they're so burdened already by how much debt they have to pay back. And the idea that you walk out, the idea that you go to a strike, all of that um, is just, it, they're overcome by this numbing fear that somehow they will never overcome this burden. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the fundamental things we all have to think about. Student loans 
are a systematic way to silence the population in this country mm -hmm. and to not allow them to to even envision or imagine a different world for themselves. And I think that is at the core of allowing, you know, that's one of those stepping stones, allowing young people to say, okay, I don't have that worry, now I can imagine something else. Right. And I think all of us as members of this community are in part, you know, responsible for changing that. That has to change that enslaves the mind. I think it could, depends upon the institution. Sure. There's one of the things, like, at San Francisco State, we have the only college of ethnic studies in the country. Yeah. And the underlying, underlying mission statement is create change agents. Mm, right. And I'm telling you, it's like, my students, that over a 30 year period, I've helped groom activists. Mm -hmm. And these kids come out, and, and when they get to the real work world, they go into social work, they go into teaching, yet they understand what kind of changes we need. Because that school was born out of the 68 strike in San Francisco. The students put their butt on the line, got beat up. Ronald Reagan was the governor, so he sent the cops in on everybody. Mm -hmm. And as a result, like, Next month, I'm going to the 50th anniversary of the program I work for, Educational Opportunity Program, which came out of that strike. And it was legislated by the Harmer Bill in California. And it's like, you know, I, I'm still in contact with my kids from way back, but you know, they seen and understand that mission is we gotta make changes. And you know, and it's also a highly diverse group of people. You know, um, I, I could have dealt with all that, and, it's, and, they, and they, all of them have a sense of what we need to change. And that's why, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of faith in those young folks, you know. As far as the, the pulse of the youth at present, I, I think everything you said at the end there is absolutely correct. I mean, I, uh, in a, just in daily existence, I think I am, almost always in kind of just a, in a state of low level terror. And, um, you know, I was, I was talking with my little brother, who's, he's, he's 23, he's three years younger than me, um, in June, about, I don't even know how it came up, we were, some, we were talking about um, finding the oil companies and like, we gotta stop the apocalypse or whatever, and and he, he you know he straight up told me, you know I I really just want to have a window to be me before the world ends. Mm -hmm. Like he he lived he's twenty three years old and he's living his life under the assumption that he's gonna be dead when he's forty five, mm -hmm. um, and I think. I think that is pervasive and inescapable. And I think it's also, I think that is also part of why it is, in my opinion, kind of bullshit to say the youth got, have got to step up. Because the reason why we are, um, you know, like so paralyzed in so many ways is because we see our parents and our grandparents in large part being more than okay with sentencing us to catastrophe. And I mean, you can just like look at the graph of people against age versus how much you care about climate change as an issue. And it is the most infuriating thing you can ever see. I mean, like you look at it, like, wow, do these people literally hate their grandchildren? Um, and, you know, I think, um, uh, Greta, what's her face, who's from, yeah, she has a really phenomenal quote when she's, um, she was like talking back to the older generation who had said something effect the effect of like, oh, you young people give us so much hope. And she basically said, screw you. I don't want you to have hope. No more hope for you. I want you to be terrified. 
I want you to be so angry and afraid so that you will actually do something because we don't have any, like, luxury of hope. And um, that's, that doesn't even exist for us. Quit pretending it's there. Um, and, you know, like, I, I just got married a, a month ago. And you know, my partner and I have been talking about, like, can we even justify having children in, in this situation where, like, there's no real reason to believe that we're going to win? I mean, I, I don't even think in terms of, like, winning. Like, I don't think I'm going to see communism or something. I mean, I, I think this, like, how you were saying at the very beginning, the, the struggle has been reframed around survival. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and yeah. hopefully we can get some pieces of utopia along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I feel like I just have to tattoo pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will on my arm or something just to, to function. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think, like, this is why, this is part of why like, there not a lot is, is happening. I mean, you ask why there's not a general strike, such as people being scared and angry. Like, you need organization, you need structures of collective action, and um, that the absence of those is also the part of why people feel so hopeless. I think a good model for what needs to be done here is what happened in Puerto Rico, uh, ousting uh, Rocio, you know, mass people, you know, mass of the people in the streets. Why we can't do that here, I think, you know, is, or have a general strike, I think has a lot to do with the fact that people, many people, still have a faith in the electoral process, especially with another election coming up, or faith in Bernie or, or Elizabeth Warren or whatever savior. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, uh, even despite the fact that uh, there have been repeated betrayals and, and people still have that kind of uh, belief in the system and somehow that needs to be, um, you know, deconstructed and uh, people have to cast away those illusions in, in order to prepare for struggle on a mass scale. It's also just that they don't see an alternative. It's not that they have so much faith in it. And that's one thing you're talking about. Um, and in terms of creating our utopia now, or offering to that saying, even asking the question, you know, how should we live, and what, you know, how are we going to make how we want to live real now in some ways, maybe incomplete, but it, it prefigures, right? This is our prefigurative politics and our projects that we're doing. This is how we want to care about people because so many people are just not cared for on a daily basis. And that is, you know, the act of caring or love in our daily lives um, is, I think, is a political project right now. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, I think, and to bring it back to ISC, or the utopian project is not being utopia no place. It's the opposite. It's we're doing the Topia project now to make these to make these interactions, human interactions that have been and alternatives to a state that either abuses you, imprisons you, makes you dependent, fills you full of addictive drugs or whatever. We have to have we have to have alternatives that in some way exist in place that may have an opportunity in the face of crisis. More crises are coming, and that actually unfortunately is, or fortunately, is our is opportunity to put mutual aid projects in place in a way. And um, certainly looking at the wonderful municipalist project in, in Spain and some of the failures there, and one of the failures being not enough alternative institutions that grew up outside of the state, even outside of a progressive municipalist agenda to, to help people live in this world right now. So, um, I just think that's, you know, there is a practical utopia that, that we need to address through, uh, through those, those, that strategy, so. Can somebody give me an example of a 
um, national general strike that has happened in the U.S.? Okay, so why are I... There have been citywide general strikes like Seattle in 1919 and San Francisco in 1934. But at national level, I mean, all... Because it's not it people, be, it's everybody. It right? wouldn't have to be simultaneously everywhere all at once. It would have to be crucial sectors of the economy that would paralyze. Yes. And that has happened. In 1949, there was a major strike wave. Pretty much every in industry, um, several million workers. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the most, that's the highest that the crest of American labor yeah. militancy has ever gone. So the only the only catalyst would be survival. I so, think at this point yeah. that could no, bring. See, I, I want to say something different. I mean, it's never been called this, but you know, the, the basically this is where I think an overall knowledge of history and social analysis is important because even though you know you want to say there's never been a general strike, so let's that that idea isn't relevant, but the general strike idea has animated all kinds of left and liberatory politics as, a, as an active possibility that people move toward. It has a material effect, even though never there has never been one. You know, we don't have already, you know, really existing socialism or communism either of a certain kind. But even to have to imagine a sense of possibility that we could refuse, yeah. and all the movements that that are based on refusal and resistance partake of a kind of mythic idea of a general strike, just like no, you know, and monkey wrenching, saying no, and the civil rights movement too. I mean, if you look at pieces like it doesn't get called this, but the. Montgomery uh, domestic workers movement that shut down the bus system and launched, you know, the civil rights movement, not to mention Martin Luther King, shut down the bus system and they didn't go to work and use the system for a whole year. And, you know, so there are moments where just citizens as a group refuse, you know, somehow. And I think it, it attaches itself to a kind of sense of imagination and a, po and a possibility. So that's why, I mean, I like that. I mean, I think we have to hold on to the moral outrage, too. And I think it's especially with respect to the thing that I was saying about, you know, these children. I mean, how can we possibly live with this? I mean, prior to organizing everything, but how can we possibly not just say no, you know, to something? And I think we have to kind of do both, you know. But that's, it's just outrageous beyond belief. But anyway, that's sort of the general strike. I think the civil rights movement had a lot of that in it as well. Just to hit check on what Ness was saying is that I spent a lot of time in France. And um, what, last fall, there was this thing called um, Noir de Louvre. Well, no, first it was um, Noir Louis de Louvre. And that's when he's standing up at night. Um, which was a really interesting movement because um, people would go to work during the day <laughs> and get paid. Um, but then they would go out and express ref mass refusal at night. Um, and that went on for a really long time. And then the, the, the Gilets jaunes started. Um, so I've been very inspired. You know, yeah. I identify as an anarchist slash social ecologist. So it's funny to hear me keep saying strike. <laughs> But, and I mean, when I say a general strike, I mean mothers, I mean unemployed. And in France, when they have these, the unemployed are a sector of the society. So it's not just workers. It's the unemployed are actually identified as, um, uh, they're called chômeurs. They're the people who have no employment. And they're, they are a, a group, a, a targeted, um, marginalized group. But I'm thinking about, and I think of the civil rights movement, and what I've been thinking and imagining since since Trump, like even started to make us crawl towards getting the even just winning the primary, is what would happen if we got hundreds of school buses and filled them up with people young and old, and decided to go around the country to schools of 
elementary, middle is harder, high school, less hard, colleges, universities, community centers, churches, mosques, synagogues, wherever, libraries, and go do popular education about what is democracy, you know, what is a Republican democracy, um, what are you right now losing, right now? And I think white Americans who are voting for Trump, who are clean, clinging to their whiteness because it's the only fucking thing they have because they know that the economy and that they're, they're gonna, the jobs are going to be washed away. The only thing they're going to have left is their whiteness. They have to understand they're going to lose more than their whiteness. They have to understand they're going to end up in tent cities along with black and brown people. They have to. And Trump is playing that race card, the, the card against immigrants and xenophobia and et cetera, because he doesn't want people to see you're all gonna, we're gonna be, not just two tier, it's gonna be tent fucking city. And I went to Rio, I have to tell you, that was fucking insane, and when have been to Rio, to see a city, a wealthy city, and right next to the city, not, housing projects. I'm talking houses made out of cardboard and tin that are falling in and on a tour of the favelas and no people literally living in shit and old people and sick people and babies living in shit. And that is where the white people here who are clinging to their whiteness against the black and brown people, that's where they're gonna end up. And they have to understand that if they lose democracy, that's what they're gonna get. And I feel like if we could create a movement for, to educate people about what does democracy look like, and there's utopian democracy that's you know, direct democracy, and there's Nazi utopian democracy that's Republican representative democracy that we you know, want to move from there to here, but we have to, we have to rescue this now, because if we lose what's left of this democracy, we are all going to either end up in prison or in concentration camp. Um, Cages, because after the little kids that were sitting there, the immigrants, it's going to be different identity groups. I, I feel and know that with my whole heart and soul. That, that's, that's testing. How do you feel about black and brown babies in cages? And people seem to feel fine enough about it when it continues for months and months and months. It's going to keep pushing. So I feel like if we could get buses, I don't know if you've seen, and travel and have mobile educational projects that we do listening to communities and speaking with communities and really educating people about what really is your enemy. It's not immigrants or African Americans or sexual minorities or Jews or Muslims. It's fucking authoritarianism and capitalism that's going to come for you. And I feel like that project, to me, like I feel like the the like the you know there's these, there's the minimum program, the transitional, and the, the maximum program. I feel like the minimum program right now is that base level education. The dystopian project. It is, actually. <laughs> it's kind of a fucking dystopian, and we could have a really good time, too, <laughs> in the past we could party and educate ourselves and each other. And, and I do believe it has to be multi-generational, and it has to be multi-representational and inclusive. But I, I, I don't know, like, where would this even start? But that's what I see. I see fucking buses. <clears throat> Going places. You know, I see one thing that, you know, I mean, you're talking about the kids on the border and the situation, and we're fighting an evil media, yeah. like Fox News, and the, even the vice president goes up and says, oh, there's nothing wrong with these kids, and you're watching them in a cage. That's what I'm saying. That's more, more Orwellian things. They're saying, oh, well, you know, they don't have soap. They don't need soap. They don't need toothpaste. They don't need diapers. You know, and, and people are eating that, you know? And I'm, um, Interesting when you went to France because I remember in '68 when the May Days in France were they, yeah. they shut the whole country down. Whole country. And that was that's, there's, a, there's something to be learned from that, you know. I mean, they because I happened to be in Bulgaria for the World Youth Festival right after that happened, and the French students were pumped. I mean, they did it, you know, because they got. Six, hmm? It was six weeks. Yeah, I got some photos. I got photos of that. Like they took, like the main, they turned over all the cars. In <laughs> the main, what's the, what's the main street in Paris? Yeah, it was like all these overturned cars down there, you know, and um, they did it. And like I say, I got to meet with a lot of the French students in 68 at the Warrior Festival, and they were pumped. Yeah. 
they did it. They said, you know, we shut them down. You know, that's something to look at. It is I really disagree that the that the strategic orientation is to try to convince back from the edge um, the far right base. I think I mean there are <laughs> there have been fascist societies and in them, you know, just like we have in the United States, a quarter to a third of people to the very end will think this is good and fine. I mean, like, yeah. fascist Spain has, was filling mass graves more than any country on the face of the earth. And, you know, when Franco dies, a third of the country still thinks, like, this is the one good dictator. The, I think the, way, the only way out is to activate the majority that isn't, is already against this. I mean, we are not in the minority on that front. Um, it's just that there's a widespread demobilization. I mean, this is like axis of or spectrum of allies 101, you know, demobilize your opponents and activate the people on your side not trying to win. I just respectfully people. agree with you, and I misspoke. I didn't, I, I did not mean go try to talk to fascists. I never, I mean, that's, I, I you know, especially I really like is move with the people who are moving or have the most likely, you know, the most to gain really. Um, I, I have no interest in trying to convert fascists at all or talk to Trump's face. What I think the, the, where these buses, my fantasy buses would go, would be <laughs> the people who are really unclear, or these people who are like the undecided, the people who are living like in the rest of the world, or just everyday fucking people. Right, who don't understand really what's going on. And there are white people who are not full on fascists who don't even know that they're racist and they don't even know they're clinging to their, their whiteness. And that's why they're maybe going to vote for Trump next time. So I do not, I, I completely agree with you that tact, tact, tactfully, um, that it, I don't believe it's tactful to make my audience the fascist who is the least likely to move, they have the most to gain from Trump's world. It's, it's the people who are, the, the majority who are the un, us, all of us, in some ways, the uneducated about democracy and what's really happening to it and what will happen if this continues to go in this direction. So I, I completely agree with you on that. I'd like to circle back to some of the stuff that was said earlier uh, about the future, the lack of an expectation that tomorrow will be uh, better than today. Um, I think that hasn't been true for some time. I think that the sort of idea of sort of automatic progress inherent within history died a slow death over the course of the 20th century. I mean, the, the slogan of no future has existed since the punk scene in the 70s. Um, nihilism is, you know, deep rooted in those generations um, that came before. It's not nothing unique. And I'm not sure that, I mean, obviously climate catastrophe um, is a new variable in the mix, but I'm not sure if sort of imminent self-destruction of society and the world that we know is any more, um, is any closer today than it was, say, in the Cold War, mutually assured destruction of by nuclear weaponry. I mean, that that might well come back too. I mean, with with climate change, with climate change, um, with rival world powers that have nuclear arms, limited resources, this is very much, this could be in the cards. You never know. Uh, trade wars could be the shooting wars. You don't know. Um, but I don't think that it's unique to this generation. I think there's good reason to view the present as bleak. And I think that the future that, that we should aim to recover really today exists in the past. I mean, the most, the most radical reimagining of what society might look like isn't something that's been dropped up recently, but actually existed, I think, in a more radical form in the past. Um, 
nevertheless, I don't think that it's just a matter of um, just educating people or sending around buses. Uh, I don't mean to be too polemical about that, but um, there are signs that like, we might be able to read the tea leaves of you know, our political moment. Um, the resurgence of interest in you know, democratic socialism, the growth of the DSA, to me, that has symptomatic significance. It's not, I mean, the function of the, the DSA historically has always been as just a pressure group in the Democratic Party. It's to try and move the Democrats left. Today, yes, it's had a surge in membership. It has more radical, former Trotskyists, Maoists, Stalinists, anarchists, liberals, um, and whatnot. Um, and they've made a pledge recently that they're gonna, gonna do the Bernie or bust thing officially. They're not gonna back any Democratic Party except for Bernie. Uh, we'll see uh, when 2020 rolls around if when uh, the Democratic National Committee inevitably torpedoes Bernie's candidacy, um, whether the DSA folds on that or reneges on that uh, principle. I suspect they will. Um, I mean, to me, so the, again, the DSA functions to recuperate uh, social energies, funnel them back into the Democratic Party. I think that growth does indicate that there is more energy to recuperate. So there is a, a growth in interest in the act of transformation in society. And perhaps that is some limited cause for hope, though I am, I tend to be more on the pessimistic side of things. Um, one fear that I have in what Hyatt was talking about, though, is saying, like, oh, I don't want to think of myself as anarchist or uh, liberal or whatever. Um, we just need to oppose this thing going on now. I think that once, once one allows the sort of singular motivation of we have to stop this existing order, <coughs> It, um, it leads us to want to liquidate our own politics. Um, to say like, oh, it doesn't matter as long as we're able to shut this thing down. I mean, most of these concentration camps that Trump is using today were built under Obama. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't view him as the singular evil or unique threat. Yeah. I mean, perhaps the, the rhetoric has been amped up. Um, but I mean, he probably still won't meet the, the deportation numbers that Obama achieved. And with all these ice rays and with all the cruelties that he's needlessly added on to it, um, I don't view him as a uh, total departure from the detention and deportation regime that preceded him. It's continuous. And I think it's dangerous to, to, to just say, we just have to stop this thing. It's like this sort of you know, singular focus on the, the real and present danger of the Republican Party and Trump, just like they were against Bush. And, you know, it was hallelujah, our savior Obama has come to save us. And it was just more of the same. Can, can we assert here in this space that the DSA There are differences in focus, definitely in rhetoric. Trump is a lot less uh, polite. I think that's what I, I think that's what outrages liberals most is that they were fine with the deputation numbers under Obama, even though they were higher than Trump. Um, it's just that he's more in your face about it. He has less tact about presenting it. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff would be swept under the rug. I mean, and Hillary was a, was a more, uh, for all of her lack of charisma, she was at least more uh, trained as a politician, a career politician, a politician's wife. Um, that was her whole, uh, her whole life. Um, I think that she would have been, I, I don't think that there would have been the same level of outrage about similar things going on if she was less. I think, go ahead. Well, um, I just wanted to 
shift gears a little bit and share a few things that I noticed this week. Um, uh, so I'm a lawyer, and um, that's mostly what my network is. My professional network is other lawyers, and I have friends in Congress um, who are staff, high, very high-level staff people. I've got attorneys working on immigration issues in various places around the country, and folks doing uh, some of the organizing, like in the Never Again stuff. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I heard this week that um, was interesting to me that I hadn't known before was that um, if there was testimony given in uh, one of the committees uh, saying that I think 100 of the CPB, uh, that's Custom and Border Patrol, officials uh, who are supposed to be working on the border to prevent entry are working um, uh, in the detention centers and have committed suicide. And um, so there was an effort to put that into the record to try to stop um, uh, the detention of the children. Um, so not only are uh, people um, outside of government trying to hold um, members of the government, uh, the Trump administration, accountable and stop it, but the people who are doing the work um, are also feeling um, conflicted. Uh, well, they're, they're killing themselves over the issue, and, which seems, it's, I think, a very interesting thing to do where, you know, if you don't like your job, you quit your job, right? Um, so I'm not really sure what's going on with the choices people are making in their employment, and I think that that is something that deserves more discussion. Um, and again, um, another thing that came up, I think, in the last few days was a white nationalist link was sent to an immigration judge, so panel of immigration judges, um, and that there's attempts to decertify these judges who are attempting to, again, shut down the camps. Um, or, and um, so there's uh, a lot of uh, layers of complexity and how the government is functioning. And um, I think that um, more uh, engagement, perhaps. I know that a lot of anarchist folks don't really want to really befriend <laughs> folks in the government too much, but um, I think that that might be uh, something that uh, might get more movement. That, that's what I'm going to share. I'd like to make just a quick point of clarification about the deportation numbers between Trump and Obama, because what we said is true, it's also super misleading. Obama deported more people in eight years than Trump has been able to in two and a half. Right. Um, but the, the, the monthly... Four year, the four-year number is like between... The monthly rate of deportations under Trump are still markedly higher than what happened during the Obama years. Not that I have any desire to defend Obama in any sense, but there has been an escalation. Recently, I would say so. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to bring up, I mean, under previous administrations, like the Clinton administration, that's when they started the privatization of prisons. And there, you know, under that, you know, a lot of people of color, People have started working for, you know, slavery. They have, you know, imprisoned children there too. Many, many children. So, I think that this has, this kind of thing has been going on yeah. all the time for years and years, at least yeah. 20 years. Uh, so it's not really something specific of Trump. Well, let's say before passing it out, uh, they, the family separations. As a sort of policy is somewhat new, I'll grant. Uh, though there was a gap in the democratic sort of manufactured outrage at the family separations, um, they circulated this photo um, of children in cages.
then would like look at what Trump is doing to the, these children. And it turned out later that the photo was from 2014 um, under Obama's watch, which they were then very embarrassed to admit, of course. Um, but, yeah. uh, sometimes a helpful like the heuristic or framing device that I can't remember if Murray used these terms or not. Um, but it's, it's really important to look at, when you're looking sort of at, at a stretch of history, looking at what is continuous and what is discontinuous, what is novel and new at a particular historical juncture. And I think that if we look at the movement from, say, Obama's administration to, to Trump's and say, well, it's, it's, just, it's still just more of the same. We're, we're just looking at the continuities and we're not looking at some really important show-stopping discontinuities. And I don't think I have to go through the list of them, but some people, you know, go through a list of what, what is, what are the, you know, how do you know you're living in a fascist society? How do you know you're looking at somebody who wants to be a dictator? What are the features of a dictator? That, you know, the events in Charlottesville, um, or the president basically firing a member of leader of the FBI who was going to try to <laughs> bring it down, or murdering a, you know, a prisoner who had dirt on him. Th these are kinds of things that, that happen in a dictatorship. I think if we're going to say only look at the continuities, which of course, I was an anarchist precisely because I was very aware of the hard, the hard shit show of, you know, I was in, I was in Seattle when Clinton brought the fucking National Guard out and started shooting at American citizens. I was there, and I know other films room were in that were in that city. It was like holy shit. <laughs> um, so I, I have no love for the Democratic Party or <laughs> or the Republic. That's that's not it. It's that I think we have to be able to name what are these discontinuities that are surfacing so that we can see how things are shifting and get a sense of, of, of direction of where to go. And that it's, it's important to look at the continuities too, but it's really important to see what is novel here, what is, what is new. There's a lot of new shit happening. Well, I really agree with that, Haya, but I, mean, I feel like the discontinuities are part of a continuum with the continuities. It's not like any of that shit's a surprise or based on the agency of some guy with weird hair. And really, we can't be talking about this motherfucker anymore because that's, that's the whole game, right? Let's try and get back on our Facebook roll before bedtime with some other horrible shit that he's got to say, right? This is all, y'all are all like way past some sort of like analysis of liberatory Marxism and where we are in late stage capitalism. Everything is consistent with what we've been predicting and been and what's been foreseen from folks that were dead before we were alive, right? So we just, I mean, we've got to be consistent with our team, right? There are the motherfuckers that really are trying to imperialize everything. We're in the late stages, so they're going to liquidate the means of extraction and liquidation, and which includes us. We've got to be revolutionaries and really mean it, right? And stop, like, trying to have an analysis as though, like, a policy angle even when we believed in the superstructure of the government, or if at any time we ever did, right? But even when there was a utility there, um, <clears throat> you know, it only, we were only able to influence policy at a scale appropriate level when we had a crushing movement that all but ignored the government was really making shit happen in the streets, right? So the analysis of like, what sort of phrases we would love the government to utter if we could, is like, you know, again, it, there's, a car, there's a cart and a horse thing to be said there. I just think that, uh, yeah, this, none of this is a surprise. Whoever the puppet is on the hand at that point, at this point, doesn't matter. We got a lot of goddamn work to do. We have a lot of very sort of like rote information to share with the public about how capitalism works and what our opportunities are to confederalize or whatever we want to do in response to that. There's a bunch of really brilliant people in the room. I, mean, I think we have an opportunity to talk about doing that and you know, not, not maybe discontinue 
our conversation about the discontinuities of the orange monster. Uh, um, I think kind of going off that, I wanted to bring it back to like, you know, the I guess the title of the panel or the topic like beyond the local, right? Um, and like I, I wanted to sort of bounce that off because I think beyond the sort of general stuff that we're talking about, like, the, like does the situation seem more hopeful or what are the particular uh, problems of the US government right now? Uh, like that seems to be emerging as like the major question in like radical left politics in all sorts of ways. Um, because um, while we do see a growing discontent with capitalism, right, we could see sort of, and this is not, um, this is kind of not new because it, it almost brings back um, a very old question of like, uh, you know, anarchist versus Marxist uh, perspectives on organizing. And you've seen, um, you've seen this idea of like, well, if we resist capitalism, do we resist it by like trying to uh, sort of like capture some of the global machinery or do we resist it purely on a local level and by retreating to the local? And, um, you know, there's been a growing debate on uh, the idea of left nationalism. You've seen it among a lot of like social democrats and uh, both in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, that support the idea of like, you know, by being against global capitalism, the best way to fight that is to some kind of retreat to like a sort of national uh, social democracy uh, to be either explicit or implicit um, kind of anti-immigrant um, sentiment. You know, you, uh, at the same time, you see a lot of kind of uh, local uh, anarchist environmentalist politics being incorporated by some of the more radical fringes of the right, like uh, Europe, yeah, na national anarchists claiming to take, take up environmental causes and, uh, you know, attacking migrants for supposedly like the support of the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a, a really a to raise this tension of when you have a sort of locally oriented, uh, uh, locally oriented politics, how do you keep that from going into the sort of reactionary and um, uh, pose? Uh, and how do you reconcile that without jumping to, without like falling back to the default of kind of, well, we're just gonna support uh, the sort of liberal, liberal globalization status quo, but um, maybe like dress it up to more radical or say nicer things about it. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. It seems to be like a press So, I, first of all, hi, I'm Hugh, this is Nicole Soranley. We got held up at the border, which is always a wonderful way to be welcome to America. Uh, they took all of our comic books, so we're sorry, we don't have any comic books. Just all of them. Yeah, yeah when they find us $500, and that was after we begged them not to find us $5,000. So, I'm just going to say, there's a lot of interesting polarities being poked at here which I, I love, I pulled apart on the internet, like I bet a lot of people have, but I'm not optimistic that anyone's going to be swayed on a question like nationalism or internationalism or state or anti-state orientations. And I guess my thinking is just, in a practical sense, the historically successful working class uh, movements of the 20s and 30s had a broad social basis. And since the 60s, I think it's kind of been an erosion of the social basis of the left, and it's become more and more a political and professional phenomenon represented by NGOs and political parties. Uh, and I don't think that it's necessarily something that any tendency has a monopoly on to do. I know this is like a very voguish term, and I kind of don't like to use it, but base building, but to uh, broadly expand the social basis of radical left politics is a useful thing that I think sidesteps, at least for now, some of these questions of like, you know, do we want to sit in a room and argue about whether or not we're going to contest local elections or do we want to like get out there and make a concrete difference in people's lives in a way that holds open the possibility of municipalism while also benefiting people directly by helping them organize? Mm -hmm. Henry's comment earlier kind of brought me back around to the earlier part of the conversation <clears throat> about why people aren't in the streets. And 
for me, I think the main reason isn't because people aren't outraged by what's happening. I think it's really clear that the proportion of people who support this shit it, are loud and are supported by the propaganda system, etc. but they're still a minority. I, for me, the, the main reason is still that we've been through decades of the system continually telling people that it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think most people who are outraged don't feel like there's anything they can do that actually matters. The, what, the response to Seattle of the Clinton administration and the responses of, of various governing bodies to people mobilizing has shifted toward the main message being to try to convince people that it doesn't matter. I mean, I came of age as a, as a radical and an activist in the 70s, and in the 70s, the main message of the propaganda system was, the 60s are over, yeah. and it's time to go back to normal, and normal was the quietism of the 50s, which, you know, everybody knew was, was idiotic, but it, over decades, people became convinced that you know, what people who were mobilized did was admirable and was nice, but that they didn't feel like they had a stake in it because the system was continually repeating the message that it wasn't affected by anything we did. And people internalized that. But it's not just the main message of it doesn't matter. It's not a visible message that contests that, yeah, that's true. It's not just that. Additionally, it's not the only message. There's also a message that if you do go out there, you'll be pepper sprayed, you'll be imprisoned, you could be run down, you'll be shot in your backyard. Yeah. I mean, there is the threat of violence, and it's experienced, of course, more by black and brown people than it is by white people. But the threat of violence is there all the time, and of repression for speaking up. And or economic repression, you know? I, I mean, you know, in some ways. So there's a constant it's threat. Long. It's not just a futility, feeling of futility. It's a feeling that you're, you'll really suffer if you if you do this. And I, I mean, you look at Hong Kong, you're like, why do we think we're, they're in the streets. Okay, what are the, what's gonna happen? We don't know, right? But if we were on the streets, would we be in a different place vis-a-vis -vis the state and the violence of the state threatening to squash us? At, or France, I don't think we would, it's any different. We would, anything would be worse. So, I don't, you know, that, I, that's what I feel like. Like, you know, we can't just go out there and make a demand of fascists. They will do, deal with us. <laughs> so we have to figure out what is the thing we do. How do we be water? I had a point when, you know, you talk about, I remember that the 60s are over, it's the 70s. The one factor that happened in the black community was a huge rise in hard narcotics. Yes. You know, heroin yeah. especially. Yeah. And that was like, you know, um, we'll pool them out. That was the whole thing. Yeah. And what you got going now? What's happening right now? When that rolled into the drug war, right? Mm -hmm. that after the introduction of hard drugs. Mm -hmm. No, no, it wasn't an introduction, but it was a rise. In fact, have you ever seen the movie The Panther by Mario Van Peebles? There's a disclaimer at the end of the movie. After they broke down the Panther Party, the Brown Berets, and those leftist movements, there was a huge influx of heroin. Because I was a heroin abuse counselor in the 70s. And not only were ex-movement people using, but I had to deal with a large portion of my clientele were Vietnam vets. Because they used to trade cigarettes for heroin in the jungle. And they can't, you know, the VA didn't do shit for nobody, but they came home with gorillas on their back, man. I hear a thread amongst this whole conversation about hope versus fear. <laughs> and I think some people are motivated more by one or the other, and that's pretty individual and, and also depends on your, you know, the experiences within your community and your society. And so, you know, you can offer someone a dystopian vision and that might motivate them to take action. You can offer someone a more positive vision and that might motivate a different person to take action. So it's not just choosing one technique or the other, but to take that bridge from how do we get individual people to decide that I'm the kind of person who takes action. You know, there's almost, there's very few people who are going to leap from someone who has never participated in any kind of movement 
to being involved in a, a huge movement, an international movement, to you know, to calling for a general strike. It's usually a series of steps, and I'd hazard a guess, without knowing most of you, that everybody here has been involved in some something that felt like a win at some point, where it was like I'm getting something out of this, we're achieving something, and so it's giving people those opportunities, which is where I think that bridge happens, and and because. You can look at it locally, you can decide what's gonna help people overcome this paralysis of everything sucks. There's no category of my life where I'm not being challenged and stressed. You can look at anything in American society and it's affecting a lot of people and mostly negatively or at least you know, in a nebulous fear kind of way. So if you can go into a small community or a small subset of people and say, hey, here are the, here are the strategies, here are some tactics, here are some techniques that will work for this particular thing, to build some positive feedback. I think that's a huge part of it because that's gonna give you a pool of people who some of them will take the next step and some of them will take the third step and become really involved and stronger leaders and spread the message. It's never gonna be everybody. It's, it's never been everybody. But I think that it's, it's kind of a false dichotomy to say you have to, you have to go with hope, you have to go with fear, you have to look at small things, you have to look at the big things. It's a continuum for, for all of us. And I would say a big part of that to get away from that continuum is you also need a vehicle. You need an organizational vehicle, and you need a political vision. And to me, that's like one of the big benefits of DSA. It's out there, it's national, people know what it is, people come looking for it because they, you know, it gives a name to these problems of capitalism, it tries to tie them together, tie these single issues together. What it hasn't done well, and what no other organization has done well either, is offering some kind of a, a more coherent strategy. I mean, there's you know, 60,000 DSA members, chapters all over the country, but they're all doing their own kind of local, individual, you know, anti-ice, food bank, garden, whatever, the same stuff we've been doing. And I think that's part of the problem, is like, whatever the left has been doing for the last 50 years, and longer than that, especially the last 50 years, it has totally failed, it's not working. And I think we need to think strategically beyond that. And I think that, I mean, to me, part of the allure and the success of DSA is that, maybe it sounds paradoxical, Paradoxical, but that level of centralization, which isn't like centralized top-down control, but it's about a common target, a common theme, a common strategic orientation. Because otherwise, we're just you know we just get fragments and all these small things that maybe you know provide these like small partial local wins, but they don't amount to something bigger than the whole as it is in like you know Hong Kong, wherever that is. And that those those big movements that you know create this polarizing us as thems also create its own problems of like a very vacuous politics, you know, as we saw with the Arab Spring. But in any case, I think the left is like, has this logic of like um, diffusion rather than accretion into something larger and more powerful, and that we're actually quite afraid of power. I just want to say, you know, um, Murray used to say, I mean, in one of his articles, uh, that follows the book on uh, social anarchism and versus lifestyle anarchism. And in the following chapter and at the end of the book, he talks about something which right now almost doesn't seem that relevant, but the idea of sort of having of a radical group having both a maximum program and a minimal program. And at this moment, it feels funny to be saying what I'm saying right now, because I'm just as scared as Chaya is. Somehow when you look at the political situation that exists in the United States, it's a very frightening thing. I mean, we, we really are on the verge of fascism, and that's what it is. So, I mean, it, it's very, you know, the, the thing you want to do is say, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Which you should be doing, what do I do? And, and, and taking every action you possibly can. But just on the other side, you just have to keep aware of what are the possibilities beyond the, you know, if there is a tomorrow, what are the possibilities for tomorrow? And that means going back to ideas of um, just educating, educating people, and the question of what does a municipalist uh, society look like, and uh, and uh, how do we, in a sense, work on an optimistic level as well as a pessimistic level? You know, sort of 
not to lose sight of, 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 of what would be the good things we could be doing, but what could be the vision that we could possibly develop for a better society. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to respond to a couple of points that have been made that um, kind of fit together. I think I really agree with what you were saying about how, you know, basically it's nobody's in the streets because it doesn't matter. Um, that we've been given the impression that it doesn't matter. Um, I really think that, you know, in more recent times, that impression came from the Iraq War because there were a lot of protests that were going on then, and that was a really big message of yeah, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care what you think. It's going to happen whether you want it to or not. This is not a democracy. Um, so that was the first big knock in the more recent time. And a second big knock was Occupy Wall Street. Um, this is not something that is really spoken about very often. You know, there's this sort of general impression, again, that we have been given by those in power, the ruling class, that, oh, Occupy Wall Street just sort of fell apart and it was just a disorganized mess. That is not at all what happened. Yeah, you're not in your head. I know, I remember. <laughs> you remember, yeah. I mean, there were coordinated attacks all over the country. The police came in the middle of the night with tanks and LRADs and sound cannons and destroyed those encampments. By um, democratic mayors, it should be pointed out, but supported yeah. by the Obama administration. Yeah. Yes, by the, the exactly, totally all orchestrated by the Obama administration. Yeah, and I mean, this is under a, you know, democratic president who's supposed to be, you know, more liberal and blah, blah. And um, so, you know, again, this message very clearly sent, not only does it not matter, uh, but we will aggressively crush you. And it has only gotten far worse since then with everything that you were saying. I mean, people are being murdered, you know, especially, again, black and brown people, if they are just existing. So it's like, what kind of message does that send of, you know, how can I go and actively resist and fight for my rights when the authorities are going to come and kill me just for existing in my own body, in my own home, even in a lot of cases. So I mean, you know, you've got, and then obviously the economic oppression and all the rest of it combined. So yeah, I think that there has been this really clear message sent of A, we don't care what you think, this is not a democracy, and B, we will kill you if you try to dissent in any way. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely there has been, you know, that's really obviously, I think, why people are not going out the way that they were before. Um, but I want to also bring up this um, issue that uh, you were talking about with the DSA and um, also what you were saying about optimism and that sort of thing, which I thought was interesting. Um, you know, you've got like, yes, I think a growing attitude of um, we have to take things into our own hands and not demand from them, but start building um, alternative systems, which I think is where social ecology really has a major role to play because that is what Murray Bookchin was all about. So, you know, I think that there is room for optimism because I do think that there is this growing awareness. I remember when I was involved with Occupy Wall Street and they said, we don't have any demands. I was like, what are you talking about? You have no demands. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but now actually I really do understand it, that it's like, we can't demand from them because they're not gonna respond. They don't care what we think. And, um, and it's, it's just futile and, and dangerous, obviously. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that our goal should be how can we make this a coordinated effort to build a new system so that when the existing system inevitably collapses, which another thing Murray Bookchin talked about, right, that climate apocalypse is going to drive that collapse of capitalism, do we have an existing system already in place to replace it? So I kind of feel like that's where the left should be heading is we need to be building a new system we need to be building a communalist system so that when the existing system does collapse, as it inevitably will, we're ready. I think, I think two of those kinds of ideas were mentioned earlier, namely Puerto Rico and Hong Kong. And we can watch very clearly there's a pattern of how those two communities, societies organized. 
and they started out by having neighborhood conversations. Uh, Puerto Rico, it's all about meeting in the Zocalo, meeting in the neighborhood community, discussing what's wrong with uh, you know this neighborhood or this street, and right now maybe people are not marching, but they still have those neighborhood organizations. And the same in Hong Kong. The criticism is, oh, you know, it's disorganized, but look at how many people are there. So it's not really disorganized underneath. All these conversations have taken place. They know exactly why they're there. They know exactly why they bring umbrellas. They know exactly what kind of symbolism um, they're sending. And the threat of China, uh, you know, uh, crushing them is real. But there are two examples that we have. We can watch. We can see how people manage to organize themselves. And I think we should be inspired by them because they talk. They talk all the time, like we're talking right now. They do this every day. They do it once a week. They meet with their neighborhood people and they talk about how we're gonna do something. We need social spaces. The problem with some areas in the United States is that we don't have enough social spaces that we take advantage of to have conversations. And of course, that's part of the general plan, not to, you know, not to give us those social spaces. But we all can create those. We can claim our neighborhood corner, we can claim our coffee shop, we can claim our neighbors uh, for a conversation once a week for a half hour. We can all build that up. Again, coming from a legal perspective, um, I just wanted to share that. Um, so I bought in pretty hard, like pretty sold on um, the Idle No More movement and putting indigenous perspectives um, sort of on the front line of things and taking my, um, uh, I, I guess, like just listening and being guided by what indigenous people are doing and um, uh, spent some time in Maine this summer. I've been going for a couple of years now um, and uh, really trying to be an ally to that community um, and following uh, this week was the first um, uh, democratic debate for Native people and um, there was a lot of talk about the doctrine of discovery which is uh, which underlies um, a lot of legal theory in the US. I know Henry said that we don't really want to pay too much attention to who the puppet is but I think that you actually can't ignore uh, federalism. Um, you know as long as there are law schools there is going to be a legal system that is going to be relying on force uh, and violence to uh, control people um, and that if you want to dismantle the, the federal national system, um, I, I think that uh, looking at the doctrine of discovery, looking at, at the movements that are attempting to uh, uh, bring that to the courts uh, is important to follow um, and it's an area that could use support um, that uh, you know our declaration of independence um, and our constitution are all uh, built on uh, notions of private property rights and uh, displacement of native people and that they're fairly organized and um, around uh, creating alternative systems and uh, that are more egalitarian and um, and that if uh, there's more buy into that we could dismantle the federalist system um, there's uh, a lot of legal theory out there uh, that looks at um, this doctrine and uh, most it's it, it hasn't I think gotten to the level of the Supreme Court yet, um, and there's a lot of, um, I don't know, I'm, again, I'm, I've watched the, the Supreme Court as well. Um, there's an attempt right now to uh, remove uh, the conservative judges that were appointed by the Trump administration. 
Um, people are pretty concerned uh, about, you know, with the rise of fascism. So we've got Ruth Bader Ginsburg again today. I learned, you know, there was a release saying that she's had some treatment, uh, some cancer treatment done, and uh, you know she's fine. But <laughs> every time they release these statements, the le my the legal community, the, the liberal legal community, is very concerned that our that we're going to lose. Um, our majority on the court um, at, while Trump is still the president. Um, and so, uh, again, I think to, it was this week, um, there's been uh, the records of the Justice Kavanaugh has been pulled and there's an attempt to, uh, and it, there's like a budding attempt to get him removed from the court um, and, uh, Gorsuch as well. Um, so uh, I think that those are very worthy uh, things that uh, more liberal people in the legal community are trying to do, um, but that there's a lot of fear um, that there's going to be another Supreme Court appointment uh, in the coming year or so. Blair said, and also add on to something of Kathy from Alvin, who is the sorry, I don't remember her name. But we and the left have not been just sort of spinning our wheels totally the last 50 years, 60 years. We've been building some alternative institutions, and I think we should be pretty proud of the number of food co ops that often do more than supply food to communities. Huge number of television stations under our control, 75 to 100 community radio stations in this country that are pretty much under our control or available for us to use to communicate with each other. Um, strings of summer camps that actually educate children in nature and in um, humanitarian ideas. But there's a lot of things are in existence that we can tap into. It's not like starting from scratch to build the building bones for a future big movement. We've got a lot in place. This is inspirational. What's been going on in Puerto Rico? What's going on in Hong Kong? Is What's going on in Venezuela? People are very organized to defend their revolution. Building after building has a commune within a giant apartment building. People meet together every week and make plans for what they need to do to move forward in Venezuela. There's meetings of farmers, meetings in rural areas of moving toward food self-sufficiency. There's a lot of local democracy modeled there. So I think if we look hard at many other places in the world, we'll see those same good experiments going on. We're not alone, and we're not starting from scratch as we build from here. Just to piggyback on top of that, I feel like one of the things that we're lacking is institutional memory on the left. I feel like we're constantly in this place where perhaps we're reinventing a wheel that's already been created 18,000 times before because we don't have that connection, that intergenerationality that, that we could really benefit from. Um, but I wanted to actually add on to that. Um, I think it's possible for revolutionaries to be more than one thing. And I think that it's possible for revolutionaries to hold multiple visions at a time. I agree with what's been said about uh, people not going out and protesting. I think that uh, like I was involved in anti-war organizing and it was incredibly demoralizing to see tens of thousands of people on the streets and then within a couple of months, even the leaders of the anti-war coalitions were like, nah, nah, don't worry about it guys, we don't need to keep organizing. It was like, totally demoralizing. Um, I think that we need to be able to keep those larger systemic critiques and like broader visions for the future while also being able to meet people's immediate needs by setting up networks of mutual aid, whatever those look like. Um, it's possible for our groups to be multiple things. They can be food shares, they can be socialist study groups, they can lobby governments. Like, we don't have to just slice off a sliver. And if we do that, we're probably going to be excluding some people who just really want to do one thing. And that's okay. They can start with doing one thing. It's just making, making space for that diversity. I think it's important. <coughs> I guess also, like, I, I mean, I'm not excluding the possibility of legal avenues, uh, you know, challenging court appointments or whatever. 
I just feel like a lot of these strategies are uh, born of the sort of dismay that liberals have felt since the sort of sudden and shocking defeat to Trump in 2016. Uh, sort of one neat trick to sort of undo that election. Uh, I don't think that ousting Kavanaugh or whatever, I mean, you can explore that avenue or ousting Trump through Russiagate or some other scandal that, frankly, the public doesn't care about except for like policy wonks and people who follow the 24 hour news cycle like obsessively really give a damn about. Um, I think it's more about building an overwhelming social force that would be, be able to extract not only, not only Trump or Kavanaugh or whoever, but also the entire existing political framework that presently exists. I don't think, I mean obviously that sounds grandiose, but that's, that's, we should be frank about what we aim for. So I'll share again. So something that's coming out of the Idle No More movement and the Native community that I've been around is um, a lot of conversation about quantum physics and um, uh, sound and tone and um, spirituality, which I know there's people, it's not religion, but um, um, uh, about uh, like a, that what's like a narrative about what they see happening um, being uh, on a on an energy level, and that um, what we're dealing with is um, uh, sort of like a rise of this very dark force that is the Trump administration that is fascism. Uh, and related to environmental uh, destruction, and that we need to begin to counter that in our personal lives as well as in our in our politics. But there is, um, I think, there's a division that I'm seeing between um, folks around whether to support Warren or they're very much engaged in national politics, um, whether to support Warren, Bernie, or uh, Williamson. And I don't know, Williamson is on the edge of being able to make it to the next round of the debates. And um, uh, I think that there is uh, a lot of um, support for her campaign because it is talking at a more metaphysical level. And um, she's sort of mocked as having no political background, that she's um, you know, not a career politician, has not worked in um, Congress or anything before, but um, there is, um, you know, she has the qualities of being able to communicate hope and um, uh, and uh, address, um, bring, I guess, bring the forefront of the environmental crisis in a way that the other <coughs> candidates aren't addressing them. Um, but she's addressing them as more very deeply spiritual problems, and that it's not actually a matter of the science anymore, which I have heard is consistent with some of the other environmental <coughs> law professors that I've been around is that this is a um, very spiritual problem and that um, it's not going to correct itself um, when we're talking at surface level, uh, at surface level issues, that there's a very deep despair that I think we hear coming up, especially with young people, and that's being transferred, that there's like this trauma that is being intergenerationally transferred, and that um, there is spiritual work that needs to be done in order for the, for the politics to transform. So um, just, that's not my thoughts, those are their thoughts, and I just thought I'd bring that here. Thanks.
Was, yeah, we're, uh, we started late, or about 30 minutes past, and so it stopped, but uh, anyone have any final thoughts they want to get out before we wrap up for the evening? Um, I, think, uh, I just say that I'm not terrified because um, I'm experiencing transfer trauma and terrified because we're on track for six degrees warming. I think that's yeah. that's it's not the, exciting, it's, it's a very physical process. Well, the trauma has a material basis. basis yeah. Which I think is a, an important addition to that and, and to your point as well that not only can our institutions and movements mean more than one thing, but they, they absolutely have to be because, you know, even as someone who spends, like, especially lately, almost every free moment organizing, I mean, there, are, there are limits, right, to the ability to participate in something like a general strike for people who, like, yeah, life-saving medicine relies on them having money, you know, feeding their children, I'm sure. Almost everyone has some form of experience or particular marginalization that is is driving those material forces and conditions, and that those are, as we know, not only results or um, unintended consequences, but are very much as well part of a, a structure that intends to keep people from participating in building mass movements. So. Just addressing, creating institutions that address in the here and now those material issues through mutual aid programs so that we are able to do some of this bigger structural organizing or longer term structural organizing as much as there is a, a long term on the time scale we're addressing right now. You can short of institutions just like our neighbor, can I help you? Mm -hmm. There's never going to be a time where talking to our neighbors is a waste of time, frankly. No. Neighbor's time is every day. <laughs> every, every conceivable theater of conflict, we can engage in. So we really have to decide what's going to be your priority. Like, we can talk about, the, if you're feeling litigious, go to the courts, become a lawyer. But if not, like, you can do millions of other things. If you want to call your senator, call your senator. You know, like, there's so many things to do. There's so many different theaters to be engaged in. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> God, enthusiastic. No, I think I interrupted you. My final thought is not a necessarily an optimistic one, and I'm in, in favor of uh, base building and, and creating prefigurative institutions and talking to your neighbors. But the climate crisis, uh, do we have, I mean, we're not uh, 20 years ago or something when this, uh, we had time, maybe. Um, but uh, we don't have time right now. So what does that mean? How do we uh, put all of these things we're talking about into that uh, greater context and figure out what the priorities are? Well, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I think that it's self-evident that the climate catastrophe is radicalizing people quickly. True. Uh, and a lot of people will die on the road to the tipping point, but while we should do our best to make it tip sooner rather than later, we have to be pragmatic about how we can disorganize the left is right now. And just like be as ready as we can. Well, going back to the place we were much earlier in the conversation, there is a call for a general strike. It's somewhat symbolic, but um, the language is out there and is being used in a, some interesting ways, including uh, folks trying to find ways to relate to uh, radical forces in the labor movement and other sectors beyond the, the student circles where it's originating from. <clears throat> Here in Vermont, it, the organizing for that looks pretty interesting, and I don't have a sense of what it looks like in other places, how seriously it's being taken, but um, I think there's some potential there. So I, not to take up a lot of space, but a direct experience that was related to this where a friend, a high school teacher, was working with some teenagers who were involved in uh, organizing a climate strike. And we went with them to sit down and talk to some people in the labor movement in Ottawa and Canada, where we're from. 
and the message to the teenagers was basically like, the first thing that you need to know is that there's a disciplinary apparatus around the labor movement, and if they strike, uh, when they have a contract, they'll be penalized with fines that are uh, ten thousands of dollars a day for members and hundreds of thousands of dollars a day for unions. And they'll be arrested if they refuse to pay the fines. So the odds of any union members participating in a general strike uh, are basically nil. And that's where you're starting from. What, so what I, what I said to the kids was that they would need to do an end run around the union leadership and talk to yeah. the rank and file workers and get them to pass sick in. Uh, but, yeah.